Okay. Uh, as we uh, continue in our studies together, uh, in our worship of our God, we want to appreciate from his word uh, how he's going to help us live out the very life of God uh, in our communities, and our families. Uh, we, we saw, as we studied through the book of Hebrews, uh, if you're visiting with us, uh, we started this study, oh, I don't know, six years ago. Where were you guys? Um, taking a little bit of time each year. But in any case, we saw the first 10 chapters deal uh, with the truth of who Yeshua is, who for our visitors, that's of course the name Jesus, uh, Yeshua is his Hebrew name, uh, who he is, uh, uh, God come in the flesh, uh, and the work that he therefore did in light of who he is, the work he therefore did, an eternal salvation, full and complete and perfect atonement, uh, a kind of perfection only God could provide. And then we saw uh, in the chapters following uh, chapters, uh, certainly into chapter 10 through into chapter 12, some of the applicational issues regarding having faith uh, and the grace of God. So we see that how do we have the benefits, grace through faith, the grace of God, faith in what God has done in the Messiah. In chapter 13, we now re realize some of that and how people are in our community to help us to grow in the very things of God. Uh, and you'll notice in your bulletin, there's outlines there for you to take notes, but also some additional information might be helpful to you. But uh, we want to understand from this section uh, how we are to grow together, uh, how parents and other leaders in our community are blessed, we're blessed by God, by them, through them, uh, to understand his guidance and direction in our life. Uh, and how to get the most out of them for our own growth. As we continue on now, the portion I'd like, uh, please stand with me if you can. Uh, let's read this portion together in unison, regardless of colors there. Uh, and uh, following that, I'll ask God to help us to understand and apply it. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. May they do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Father, we do pray that you might even now through uh, the Holy Spirit, the very one who uh, inspired the writing of the text we read, may he now illuminate our minds and hearts to the truth of the word. And as we are yielded to the one who is the living truth, our Messiah, we pray that same Holy Spirit would empower us to live out the truth that we might be spirit-led, and therefore, as spiritual leaders, that we might uh, be a light in the darkness, representing your life and your love, encouraging others in the great things of our God. I add your blessing, we pray, to the end that Yeshua is exalted. For it's in his name we pray, amen. Please be seated. Uh, as we continue in this section of Scripture, as we know that, I want to reiterate something. The whole issue of grace through faith, grace has to do with God, God kindly graciously provided for us in the Messiah. In other words, his attitude of love for us is seen in his grace, uh, that he kindly, graciously provided all that we need, and by simple faith in the Messiah, it's applied to our lives and seen in our fellowship. We saw at the beginning of the chapter, uh, this grace through faith reveals love through our community and respects leaders in our congregation. We'll continue in that regard as well, so let's understand the issue of leadership. Uh, by the way, uh, for those who have not been with us, you may be seated here uh, and you're saying, well, this cannot apply to me. I am not a leader. And if I am, I'm underpaid. But you want to understand every one of God's people are called to leadership, whether it be uh, just spirit-led in your own life uh, whether it be in your home or whether it be in the community, uh, you're called of God. How many of you, especially the visitors, I saw you had bunches of kids. We love kids around here. Uh, how, many, how many people have more, than, uh, th have more than two children? Raise your hand. Oh, God bless you. And how many of those kids do you want to become mature? How many of them? All of them. Come on. Isn't that a little greedy? All, I mean, one out of three gets you into the Hall of Fame. Baseball Hall of Fame, just batting wives is one of the three. You want all of them to be mature? So does God. And maturity is seen as leadership. 
as you care for others around you and reach out and not caught up in your own stuff. And so we want to continue on understanding grace through faith, through leadership. Uh, what does it look like? We learn from leaders who are teachers. We saw that in verse 7 of this chapter. Uh, we'll take a look at we listen to leaders who are shepherds. Uh, and we love our leaders who are servants. Verse 25, the word leaders is used in each of those verses. It's the only place where this word is used in this regard. Uh, and, so, and it's used three times in this chapter, so we see a, a little outline for our considerations. But moving on, we want to understand uh, some of the matters that pertain to our life. Because the scripture said that uh, there's a possibility that we may not be getting the most out of this deal. That somehow, uh, you we're leaving a lot of meat on that bone. It, we're not getting all the profit. It could be unprofitable to us if we don't have a proper relationship, interaction, responsiveness to leaders around us. And so we want to understand uh, how to, about the issue of profitability here. Uh, the word that's used in the original language uh, has to do not just with paying taxes, but getting a return. Uh, ta how many people are thankful for tax returns? It doesn't take the edge off of taxes at all, but we're thankful for something. Anyway, paid return on your expenses. When you get a return check on your expenses, that's what the word means. Useful, advantageous, profitable. So it pays to have faith. That's what the writer of Scripture is saying. You talk about finance. I'm talking about something greater than this world can understand. For eye has not seen, nor his ear heard, nor has entered in the heart of humanity what God has prepared for those who love him. And so what God has for you is beyond money, may only be one aspect of things in life, a mere tool, as we say. Uh, there are false teachers who tell you it's more than that. Uh, but in any case, God has more than that for you. But you may be saying, well, it hasn't been profitable for me. Well, let's understand how we work this through. By faith, we're to use our time, talent, or treasure for gaining a greater spiritual return on investment, our ROI. You say, well, what investment am I making? Your time, your talent, your treasure. I'm not giving any time to this. You're here, aren't you? Or for those who are live streaming uh, with us, hello, Oklahoma, and other parts of the world, uh, those who are live streaming, you're taking your time. Are you getting the most out of it? Are you making the best investment of your time, your talent, and your treasure? You say, well, what difference does it make? That's what makes the difference. That's actually what makes the difference. As the old saying goes, you know, Bill Gates has 24 hours of the day just like you. What are you going to do with your time may make the difference. Not how much you got, but what are you doing with it. And so as we consider the issue of what it means to spiritually get more bang for the buck uh, out of our leadership, you say, out of the leadership, you want to squeeze them dry. You want to get everything out of them uh, because they are called of God to be instruments of grace into your life. They may not know that. They may not have been taught very well as leaders. I'm talking about parents as well as people in our community and congregation. They may not understand their role as leaders. But if they do, they will be a greater instrument to you. But if you understand the role they play from God into your life, you will understand that that is going to be a means of blessing for you. And so what kind of blessing may grow mature in Messiah, be conformed to the image of the Son, to the fullness and stature of the Son of God, having greater spiritual victories in your life. And, uh, and of course, the most important thing, to bring greater glory to uh, Hashem, to the name that is above every name. And so, as we grow in this regard, we want to understand and, uh, the issue of leadership. Some of us really shy away from the whole matter. Uh, the issue of leadership has been rather a, a threatening thing in our society and history because of all the corruption that goes on. Sinfulness and the corruption of humanity has made leadership to sound like a bad word, you know. Uh, and so, uh, what, what Sir Acton said, uh, power tends to corrupt, absolute power tends to corrupt Absolutely. In light of all of the issues of the corruption of humanity, we see that leadership and authority and all of the issues of power uh, can be put like putting a gun in the hands of a child and it seems to be hurting people, not helping people. And so many of us have gotten the wrong lessons out of life. 
We have learned to merely protect ourselves from the very instruments that God has for us. And, and so we cut ourselves off from the very issues of our soul. When you see what the scripture says, when it uses uh, words as it does, because of the rampant abuse of power, you might look at the word obey and submit and just want to run for your life. Like what's someone going to try to manipulate me and try to control me and try to take advantage of me? This is the way people will normally respond in our society. Uh, and so uh, questioning authority seems to be the wisest course of action. Uh, and so we want to understand that, that all of the issues of human history, and because of the sinfulness of human history, uh, can have us close our hearts uh, to the truth of God and actually to the very leadership and servants he has to be instruments of encouragement to our life. And God has that for our life as well. So when, when it talks about the issue of being unprofitable, uh, for us to disobey and rebel. Uh, many of us have learned the wrong lessons. Uh, I'll, I'll, ju uh, I'll just take my chances with that. You know, if I end up with a few less blessings but a few less scars, good deal for me, okay? And we can actually live that kind of way. And even worse, you know, you can say, well, you know, I think all of this was written by people who want to keep their power base, you see. <laughs> I was at one place uh, teaching, uh, and a guy came up to me afterwards. And he said, I said, do you believe what the scriptures teach? We're having a conversation. He said, well, uh, I believe it was written by somebody. I think the Levites wrote it just so they can figure out a way to keep being fed. Can you <laughs> the whole religion to feed them with all these sacrifices. I said, you really think they went through all the trouble of writing this and going through all they would have to go through just so they could get a free meal? Don't you think just getting a gig somewhere would be a lot easier than all that, you know? So many people would think, you know, that, that the Bible is just because it's written by men. Uh, therefore, it has all the, the problems of humanity. You've got to be careful about it. Well, no. Uh, it was written uh, by God who utilized people like his pens to get his word out uh, in, in the scripture. So as we grow here, we want to understand that when we choose fear of people over, over faith in God, we are the losers for it. We are the losers. When we decide, my fear is my wisdom. My fears are my wisdom. If we think like that, cynicism, despair is going to be our life. Uh, rather than faith in God, we're going to find that the disobedience uh, is going to bring us uh, to lose all the blessings that God has when we trust him, trust his word. Trust his word. You say, but my husband is like a really bad leader. We're not talking about him, we're talking about you and your response to God, even if you have a less than perfect leader. There isn't going to be one president of the United States who's going to be perfect. I don't care whether you're a red stater or a blue stater or purple when you put it all together there. It doesn't make a difference. Uh, they're just humans, and therefore it's going to be your responsiveness to God uh, that's going to be seen uh, as you yield to the very authorities that God has for us uh, and not develop a rebellious spirit thinking that it's a safer way to go. Be, way be careful of that. Be careful of that. Very quickly now, a simple outline we're going to be following on this verse. Some of the visitors may be thinking, you know, all this is about one verse. All this is about one verse. Sad, isn't it? Oh, well. But in any case, there's three parts to this one verse. Your return on investment is impacted uh, by, first of all, your respect for your leaders. Uh, I took a, I guess, David, that may be a picture of you a few years ago, just saying. <laughs> a little prophetic picture taking there, I think. Or maybe me. I, I don't know. It's hard to tell us. That's why I have the beard tells us apart. Respect for your leaders. Uh, the responsibility of your leaders and also the responsiveness to your leaders. I couldn't come up with any more R's, so it's only three points. 
uh, obey your leaders, when we take a look at the issue of respecting them, the first aspect he brings up is the idea of obedience. And so when we consider that matter, this is something normative in regards to the messianic movement. Regarding the Messiah, it said in the prophecies in Genesis 49.10 uh, that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes, and to him will be the obedience of the peoples. The very fact that Messiah has come will be seen in our obedience to him, even as I have a portion from the uh, rabbinical writings of the first century, uh, Talmud, Sanhedrin 98b, uh, that they reflected on the same truth, that that would be the Messiah. Uh, calling him Shiloh as well. And so the scriptures go on. When Messiah came, he let us know that he had been picking some more specially authorized servants to convey his truth, to write down what we have as scripture, New Covenant scripture. Uh, and so uh, he says, like, he prayed in uh, John 17, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those who believe on me through their word. And so we have the apostolic teachings that are the foundation of our faith. Our faith is founded upon the teachings of the Shalachim regarding their special calling uh, to do just this work. Uh, but then again, it goes on to say that that truth of the apostolic teaching will be passed on like in a relay race from generation to generation. As it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, uh, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. And trustees, the faithful men will be able to teach others also. And as it says in Ephesians 4, for our call to worship, Messiah gave some people as shepherds, as teachers, to equip God's people for the work of service. So we see that the issue of his uh, life is going to be seen in our responsiveness to his life. He is the truth, and therefore we are responding to the truth just like the Word of God in Scripture is the truth, so He is the living Torah, and our responsiveness to Him shows our faith in the living God, of course, uh, and His Word. Uh, and so, uh, the very portion that is be we're looking at, it refers back uh, to what we saw in chapter 13, 7. Uh, remember your leaders who spoke the Word of God to you. And considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. So when we say obey your leaders, it has to do with obeying in regards to their teaching of the Bible. It has to do with their accurate teaching of the Bible. Uh, not what, you know, what stocks to invest in or something like that or something silly. It has to do with their teaching of the Word of God uh, and the life they lived out in light of their own teaching. Uh, that they not only taught it, uh, but they uh, lived it as well. And you can see from how they modeled it what they were talking about. Uh, so with parents, uh, your leadership role in the home, you need to be teaching the Word of God and living out the very values of the teaching that you present. You say, well, I don't do any of that. I don't know what's going on then. You're making up it as you go along. Uh, you're not actually guiding your family according to his truth. You're making it up just to kind of uh, get out of this deal alive somehow. But no, uh, you need to uh, teach your children according to God's word uh, and live out the values of that. And therefore, they're to be, uh, the children are, are to be obedient to the parents uh, in light of their teaching of scripture and those kind of matters. You say, well, what about uh, when I tell them uh, that... Uh, they are to do as I say, but not as I do. I think you're ready for politics. <laughs> you got a future ahead of you there, you know? Uh, so that, that, that lying through your teeth parenting gig is going to pay off somewhere in politics. Good for you. Okay. Uh, let's not get more cynical than need be. As we move along, let's understand the issues of this obedience and what it means. Uh, we need to, you know, hear, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Messiah. Uh, Romans 10, 17. Moving along, uh, we want to understand. To, to obey uh, the word in the original language, uh, and if you're visiting uh, and you're thinking, this is a fairly nerdy group. No, no, don't blame them for me. I may be a little nerdy. They're good guys. They're all good. Uh, the word obey in the original language means to persuade or co be confident. Uh, it's obedience produced by confidence uh, that these godly leaders uh, are teaching the word of God. 
uh, so uh, that your obedience uh, is to their accurate teaching of the word. Uh, your, your confidence in the word is seeing your obedience to the word uh, as it's accurately, properly taught and its applications in other areas of life uh, as well. And so as we, uh, as we consider this matter, leaders are trusted who have two things going for them. Uh, and parents, you want to take note of this in your life. Uh, leadership character, leadership competence. Character and competence, the values, ethics, integrity that make up character, and the issue of ability, effectiveness, and results that make up competence. Uh, and so if you're one of those parents that said, well, I, I came here this morning with seven kids, but if I leave with five, I guess that's a pretty good number, right? No, 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 we don't, don't leave any kids behind. Don't leave none behind. You want to make sure you get them all. You got to be effective able parent as well. And so the issue of character and competence, how does, how does that come about? Oh, glad you asked. Uh, the ministry of the word into the life. You will have character developing in your soul as you have the word of God embedded in your life as you take his word and make it your thought life. Uh, your word have I hidden in my heart I might not sin against you. Psalm 119, verse 11. How will a young man keep his way pure if he keeps it according to your word? And so when you take the word of God, not just memorize it, but personalize it and act upon it, you're going to find your character developing in light of the word of God. That's how you develop a godly character. Uh, and so that's where that comes from. And then the ministry of the word through the life, as you teach those very things that you're living out, as you have renounced within yourself before you denounce them in your children or others, and live according to the word, as you minister that same word, that's where your competence comes from. We want to understand this a little more deeply, if I may. A little more, you say, more deeply than that, I'm already lost in space here. Uh, this is being uploaded as well, so you can study it over later on. But in any case, character and competence, the trust and credibility that come when those two areas overlap in your life. You want those two things to be part of your life. Uh, that's where trust and credibility come from. Let's look at the scripture to understand this matter. We saw this portion before. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.2, 2. I just like saying 2.2, 2. that's why I like that verse, by the way. Uh, these things you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men, that's people of character, faithful men, and trust these to faithful men. You say, well, what are you talking about? Parents, your kids are being entrusted by you, and they, by the time they hit 18 and following, they are to be faithful people. Why? Because they can go get married, uh, and fortunately they do invite you to the wedding, it's, it turns out. They will get married, and when they get married, and they say, I do, they are now leaders in a new home. But they're only 18. <laughs> That's the way it works. So you got these years to pre prep them, and get them ready, be faithful men who will be able, able, able to teach others also the competence and so we see the character and the competence, faithful men who be able to teach others. That's how this relay race of faith is going on. As families are training up their children the way they should go, so when they are old they will not depart, teaching them the word of God, who will then, they will then teach it to their children from the word of God, on and on and on. That's, that's actually how it was set up to be and how we are to live out our lives as a community. Out of that faithfulness, that ability, the character and competence that develops, we have there, that produces the confidence and obedience. It produces that, and so therefore you're going to find people both confident and willing to respond positively, to obey what you have to say because you're accurate in the word and you have a character that reflects the truth of that same word. Does that all make sense? If it doesn't, I'm not going to repeat myself. Okay. 
Moving on, it says not only to obey your leads, but submit. You say, what's the difference? Obedience has to do to the instructions, your response to the instructions. Submission has to do with your response to their authority, to their position. Right? Obedience to their precepts, to what they're teaching you, and then responsiveness, submission, is to their authority. That's what it's referring to in that part of the verse. You say, is that like a different thing? Sure it is. Uh, and so we're going to have compliance. Obedience brings about this compliance to the position that God has given them. Uh, to submit means uh, exactly this, to accept and yield to their authorized authority and Messiah. Uh, and so we want to be doing just that. Uh, many, if the flesh seeks power, uh, if you want to know what it's like uh, to be a fleshly person, uh, it has to do with being desiring power. And some of us, uh, you know, we have a different strategy for getting that. And so you're passive aggressive and you found power in just being a naysayer, just being the no, just, you know, basically, you know, being the bottleneck of life. Uh, and so you're a foot dragger and you find some power in living that way. Uh, but, uh, or being, you know, aggressive aggressive and bullying people and whatever else, the flesh seeks power. God delegates authority and only gives you the power needed to fulfill that authority. As a parent, as an elder in the congregation, as a leader in any area of life. And so we want to understand together uh, what's involved here. That's why, as we saw in our call to worship from Isaiah 50, verse 10, Who is among you that fears the Lord? Let him heed the voice of his servant. His servant. And so therefore, those who are serving the master are people that are going to be having character, competence, are trustworthy, and therefore we can yield to their authorized authority in our life. But the question might be, are you resisting such authority? Are you resisting God's authority in your life? And you decided to become like a holy hermit? You come out every Shabbat morning just to check out the other holy hermits, you know, uh, come out of your man cave kind of place from behind your PC screen, see what's going on, go back to it, just live your life isolated that way, no sense of community, no sense of fellowship, just living, is that, are you resisting God's authority and therefore you live that way? You don't want to, you know, people are the problem. No, people are your calling. People are your calling. Uh, and so we want to understand the calling as well. Uh, there's five areas. I'll just quickly touch on them. Uh, for those who've been with us before, we've touched on this before. God in the scriptures has uh, five areas of delegated authority from him to make sure we have a community uh, that runs well. Uh, and so we want to just quickly note them for you. Uh, government to citizens. Uh, even as the scripture there says, every person be subject to the governing authorities, etc. The other, there's many scriptures on this. I just have a few up there for your further study. Uh, government of the citizens, that's one way to help maintain unity in the community. Employers to employees. Uh, and so we want to understand that that matter in the, in the financial employment realm. Uh, urge servants be subject to their own masters. Uh, congregation elders to congregants. Uh, that's another area, of course, the scripture brings up uh, as those scriptures and the Bible is replete on, subject to your elders, etc. Husbands to wives. Uh, and this is something, of course, that may be uh, controversial, but people forget that the wives are to be subject to their husbands. Uh, but husbands are to be sacrificial to their wives, and so it's, uh, both people are looking, it's not one-upsmanship, it's one-downsmanship as we serve each other. But anyways, uh, so the scriptures are, are clear on that as well throughout, throughout the Bible. Uh, parents to children uh, in order to maintain, you, some of you just, some of the parents woke up and said, you mean I'm in charge? How come no one, the kids told me I wasn't in charge? Uh, how, you mean I'm actually, yes, you, you actually are held responsible by, you may not be in charge, but you're held responsible anyway. 
okay? Uh, so parents and children, I want to just note something on here for our edification on this matter. Uh, the scriptures tell us, of course, this portion from Ephesians, children obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Small children are to obey their parents. Uh, that's a word for small children. Uh, all children are to honor their parents. Small children obey. Uh, adult children are to honor their parents. Uh, the scripture says, honor your father and mother, which is the first command with a promise. And a promise, uh, honor your father and mother, uh, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Understand from just this one illustration that with every time we yield to God in light of the authority is given to us, he has a promise, he has blessing through that instrumentality of that authority. You say, but what if that husband is a bum? Uh, okay, let's just say he is. Uh, wives, in the same manner, uh, if your husbands are disobedient to the word, you are to live a life in your heart and outwardly uh, to the glory of God. First Peter chapter 3, I just summarized 1 through 6. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. You say, why? Because as you are submitted to the very position God has given him, you pray for the person even if you disagree with the policy. And when you yield to the Lord in light of the position that God has given, you are therefore going to be getting the blessings from the Lord because you're recognizing the position that God has placed in society. And so, therefore, the quality of your leader does not determine the abundance of blessings you can receive if your heart is right with God. Uh, so God has blessing and promise when we yield our life to him. Even with the weak leadership, we have this side of heaven. And the only strong leader in Messiah, you know, he's got some people in charge around here that, you know, <laughs> well, here I am. Okay, moving on. I want to just note something for you because there, you're going to find for those in leadership, a lot of people bail on these matters uh, because there are a lot of leaders, parents, elders. I find a lot of people getting married who don't understand what they're doing. They have no idea what marriage is about. Uh, and so, uh, you know, they're just looking for some legitimate or legalized sex or something like that. They don't understand. No, 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 no. Uh, there's going to be a life you're going to be living with this person for a long time long time. Uh, marriage is ministry, and they don't understand they're not ready for the ministry, uh, whether parents, elders, whatever. They have, not been, they have not delegated the proper authority to them. They don't understand that. They don't understand the proper responsibilities they have. Let's just under, go real quickly through this. Why are things the way they are? There has to be a proper balance and understanding of the authority and responsibility. Notice the matrix, if you will. Uh, the leadership responses to these matters. First of all, if you have very little authority, very little responsibility. You know the old joke, you know, uh, the boy comes home uh, from school really excited and says to mom, 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 I'm in the school play. Oh, what role do you have? I play the part of the husband. You go back and ask for a speaking role. So the whole issue, the whole joke behind that is the whole idea that husbands are to be seen and not heard or something like that. Uh, and therefore, uh, they feel they have little authority, very little responsibility, and they're apathetic in their leadership. It's not my job. I don't know. Somebody else will blame other people. Uh, and then there's others who have a great sense of responsibility, but they don't feel they have any authority. They have all this responsibility for, for children or whatever else they have, but they don't feel they have any authority to get stuff done. You know? Uh, you say, well, is that frustrating? Uh, it can be horribly frustrating. Uh, and that's why, you know, a lot of people are dealing with with it the wrong way because of their frustrations on this matter. Uh, and then there's some who have a lot of authority but a little sense of responsibility, proper responsibility. And so these become the dictators in the home, in the congregation, the community, uh, the various cult leaders uh, who ha feel they have all this authority, little responsibility, uh, the divine right kings who felt they had all this authority but how they treated others was no one's business but their own dictators and evildoers at doing such. Uh, but when it all comes together, that's where you find leaders who are engaged, interacting properly, effectively with the people they're privileged to serve. 
this is how it comes together. When you understand the authority you have and the responsibility you have, you then can minister in a way that it's a, a, a wholesome, healthy, uh, blessed kind of situation, relationship, family, community, congregation. This is where we're growing into, how we grow, and what we want to be held responsible to grow into as well. As we move on, we want to understand the responsibility of the leaders themselves. You say, well, what's that got to do with me? You are going to get very little profit, very little gain, very little benefit if you do not understand the kind of leaders you're supposed to have in your life and expect that. Many of us have such a low standard of leadership. Our expectations are so low that we don't expect anything from anyone. And that's why people get into marriage expecting very little. You know, just me and God. You know, what about your husband? Forget him. You know, oh man, <laughs> what's that got to do with me and God? So you want to understand that people don't, you know, they get married not understanding that the husband and the role he's supposed to play, his leadership role, and, the, and therefore the young women don't understand the questions they're supposed to ask to make sure the guy actually knows what he's doing when he gets married, how he's supposed to be a spiritual leader in the home, and that the parents have to be on their game when they have their first child. Well, we experimented on our first child. We're hoping number 18 will turn out okay, though. Well, you should be getting the training before. <laughs> you know, each one of your kids needs to grow into maturity. And so we want to understand the responsibility because as you are a, a you know, a, an informed consumer, <laughs> you will, you know, you will be able to have an expectation and therefore make sure the leadership is stepping up to what the Bible says they need to be doing. Nothing else is, is allowed, is permitted in this regard. And so when we think about the issue of uh, having accountability, leaders are accountable before God. You say, but I'm a parent. You are held responsible by the Lord for your children and your family. Uh, but I'm only a manager in the department. You are responsible by God at where you're working for, for the care of those people you're privileged to serve. But it's a job. You are, you're missing the point. Having a job is the mere occasion. The cause is God having you there to represent him in that organization. That you might show a life and love and caring and even handedness and all that comes with character and competence in a godly man and woman of God. So wherever you are in a position of leadership, God is holding you responsible. And so you say, well, I'm, going to, I'm not going to be ready until I have a really big I, I, I want to have a big group of people, you know. Too much is given, much is expected, required. And so if you have a, a small responsibility, thank the Lord for what you have. Be honoring to him in all of those matters. We have to give an account you know, the Lord has given us grace and gifts and blessing and power and, and all sorts of wonderful things to live out his life, to do what he's called us to do. And one day he will return and say, I gave you uh, five talents. How did you use them? I used them for your glory, O oh God. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Uh, I gave you two talents. I used them for your glory, O oh God, the furtherance of your good news. Well done, good and faithful servant. He's going to say, uh, I what about you? You only gave me one talent. I felt shortchanged. I wouldn't like the way you do business. I hid it under a rock. Here's what you gave me. Don't bug me again. You faithless, unbelieving, and disobedient servant. And so we want to understand we're going to be held to account for the very responsibilities we have and the enablement we have uh, to be able to do the job God called us to do. He enabled us by faith in Yeshua. He enabled us to have the power, the grace, and all that we need to live out his life in light of the responsibilities he's called us to do. He has not given you one responsibility that hasn't given the grace and power to fulfill them. You may be neglectful. You may be hiding it under a rock. But that has to do with you, not with reality. You are actually <laughs> turning your back on what is true and what is real. In your home, at work, or here, or at school, wherever you may be having a responsibility. Uh, each one will have to give an account of himself to God. 
What did you do with that, with that wonderful children I gave you? Children are a gift of the Lord. What did you do with those wonderful children? I, did, I, didn't, I, left, it, I left it to the little woman. I do, I, you know, I bring home the kosher bacon, and she takes care of the rest of the stuff there. You thought you almost had me there, didn't you? <laughs> well, aren't you a smarty pants? But the fact of the matter is, you are responsible as the head of the house. You are responsible, priest and prophet in the home, to teach the Word of God and to be investing your life into those children. And so, therefore, you're going to have to give an account uh, for your parenting and all those things. You say, this sounds like a lot. It's great! It's wonderful. Are you kidding? This is the best stuff. It says that each man's work will become evident for the day will show it. In other words, you're going to get blessings and rewards. You're going to be encouraged. You're going to be, you're going to be given eternal reward because of the service you provide. You're going to be, it's, it's going to be glorious. But each man's work will become evident. You are saved by faith in Yeshua, but your works will be judged. Or whether or not you are living by faith depending on his grace. If you are walking, trusting the grace of God by faith, you will then be seen in your responsibilities as a servant uh, that is worthy of reward and honor, and great will be your name in the kingdom of God, Yeshua said. So we want to understand here uh, that they keep watch. Here's the job description. We keep watch. We care like a night watchman or, or you know, uh, an Ezekiel, you know, watchman on the wall. Give warning. When you see trouble, you have to give warning. Oh, what does that mean? Parents, when you see your kids uh, involved in shows and TV things or whatever that's evil, you have to give warning. You say, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's going to be destructive to your soul and to our family. You have to give warning. Uh, if you don't give warning, you're held responsible for these matters. And so you have to care for the flock. You say, well, uh, you're not talking about work in the congregation. Not yet. Not yet. Home, it starts with the home. 1 Timothy 3, 5. For if a man doesn't know how to manage his own home, how will he be able to care for the flock of God, the assembly of God? Before you can be a leader in the congregation... Where do you first have to be a leader? Where? In the home. And that's only going to happen if, if you're spirit-led in your heart, you see, so that you're actually caring for the people around you at home, and then we become beneficiaries down the road there. And so we want to understand how all of this works. Uh, if you have a good, uh, uh, smart and money manager, you know, for those who have enough money, you know, someone is going to need to manage, I need someone to help manage my $3.23 a uh, big investment of my life here. Uh, but you say a good money manager, that's what you're looking for. What's that mean? Uh, when you invest in stocks and those things, invest in the people managing those matters. They're going to keep you on the game. You say, well, what do you mean? Oh, yeah. You know, with a small investment that we have, we're always shocked when we have people who are at the bank who actually care about our small amount of money and say, we're going to make sure it goes into a different account because it's going to get you 2% more. We're always shocked, Miriam. I'm always surprised. Like, wow, they care. Wow, isn't that wonderful? They care about our small investment uh, because, uh, because they care about us. You know, it's not going to be a big payday for them with the little money we have. Good grief, you know. I've yeah, got nothing practical. But they care, and they show their own character and competence. And it's like, wow, aren't we glad that we invested in them, you know. And so also with your faith community, you want leaders, listen, who are able to do the job, who are going to care about your souls. People are going to be able to pray for you and worry about you. I often say here at Hope of Israel, we don't want God to bring one more person than we can care for. Because we're here to care for people. We're not here for a big crowd. You want a big crowd? Write this down. You got to write this down. Uh, secrets to getting a big crowd. Ready? Here, write it down. That's good. That's good stuff. Instead of hearing me, me teach every week, have me lynched. Double the size for that week. Twice as many have come to see me die to have, than to hear me teach. I, I guarantee you that. But in any case, the issue is that you want to find a congregation who care about you and that you can invest yourself into with what you bring to the table and it'll be a great investment. That your time, your talent, your treasure will not be wasted. You need to evaluate those things. You say, well, I've never been to a congregation where, where the leadership ever prayed for me. Uh, that's like saying, I only had parents that, 
that basically left me out and didn't take care of me. What kind of, what kind of parent do you expect to be then? You gotta be reparented. Re re you have to understand what God expects from parents, from leaders in general. That's just the way it is. There's no other options. You say, well, I, I don't go to places like that. Expect more from your leadership. Expect more from your leadership. Expect them to step up to what the Bible says their responsibility is to you. If they have authority, it's because they have responsibility. Responsibility, authority, accountability all go together in the same delegated work from God. And so, therefore, if you're going to marry a guy who doesn't care for you, won't pray for you, doesn't administer the word, what in the world are you doing? You should expect a man to understand his calling and the value you have in the sight of God. You have to have an expectation of God's values. Otherwise, you're devaluing yourself. Not realizing, no, i got to give my best, and I'm going to grow to the glory of God. I'm going to be growing to be in conformity to the Messiah. Nothing else will do. Press to it. Expect it and move it ahead. And so we're called. I'm called. You as well. I'm called to watch for my soul. First area of my stewardship. Have to make sure my heart is right with God. Watch over my heart. And then my home, my family, my wife, my children. Uh, then my society, my congregation, my community, to be salt and light. I have to take responsibility for it. Not merely curse the darkness, I have to light a candle. It's not enough to say, well, I didn't vote for that bum. How dare you? You're, you're driving on the streets, aren't you? Pay your taxes. Do what is right in our society. Gives you the right to complain a little bit, bit more effectively, too. And so you want to understand have to get, I'll, I'll be giving an account for each of those areas. Each of those areas. I gave you that wonderful woman uh, that you always joke was above your pay grade. You're, how did you love her? With all my heart. With all my soul. I trust with all my life. Um, she tells, Miriam says, if I, if I die first, she'll kill me. And so as I watch over these matters, we have to understand that it's all worth the investment. Why? Because you see this, you see some of you, oh man, this is like a lot of heavy lifting. His grace is sufficient for you. His power, you're in greater is he that's in you than he was in the world. You're trusting in yourself. No. Everything God has given you is dependent upon who he is in your life, not who you are. Everything you have has to do with who he is. Goliath was small potatoes in light of the fact of the one who is greater than all. That's how a David could stand up to him and have victory. And so Yeshua said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so in your life, as you're giving out, as you're loving, as you're praying for, as you're reaching out, you're going to find yourself with greater blessing. Moving on now, we want to end up with the third point here as I conclude quickly. The third point that said there in that verse May they do this with joy and not with grief, because it won't be profitable for you. They're going to do it. They're stuck with the gig, you know? And some of you are saying, yeah, I can't wait for these rugrats to run away from home or get married, whatever comes first, you know, easier on me, got it. They're going to have, they're going to have the responsibility, whether or not they do it with joy or grief, that's a different issue here. That's a different issue altogether. So the work can be with joy, even as... Uh, as we see in the scriptures, those who are privileged to serve, uh, Paul writes, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. By the way, the visitors here, you want to know something. It is one of the privileges, I, what a joy for my soul to be able to serve here at Hope of Israel Congregation. What a great group of people. You're just visiting. Too bad for you. You're not going to get the good stuff. These are people who care about one another. They pray for each other. They pray for everybody. What a, it, you know, it's a wonderful group. of great. It's a great joy. But I travel and I meet others who don't always have the blessings that I, I may take for granted at time serving here at Hope of Israel. And so it's not a joy. It's an oy for them, you know. And so I hear complaining wherever I travel. People, oh, you know, I was at one congregation teaching on Pesach. At, uh, at a, it was a church uh, upstate somewhere. And so I'm teaching, and the, 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 the pastor of that church is a lovely man, a wonderful man, a really great guy. Uh, the church had just fired him. 
because he wasn't exactly what they're looking for. Really? Really? What a, what a painful thing he and his family had to go through. It was an awe, not a joy. Uh, but he did it with dignity, grace, and love. You say, boy, what a, what a losing end of the bargain he got. Don't be fooled. See, that's what you're thinking. Doesn't work that way, not in God's uh, economy, not at all. Uh, it's even as Ezekiel understood his calling to our people, uh, you know, uh, as you son of man, groan with breaking heart and bitter grief, groan in their sight. You say, that's a ministry? You are reflecting the grieving of the Holy Spirit. When they are going against the leadership that God has placed in their life and they make it hard and they're resisting and giving trouble and difficulties and there's a groaning and there's a grieving that goes on, you are reflecting how God is and they need to see that. They need to understand that God is grieved when you reject the very leadership he has provided in your life. And so, you know, uh, you can, this could be unprofitable for you. Absolutely so. Uh, if you, but it's not unprofitable for those servants. Yeah, but, but they're taking on the chin. You told me the guy got, got, you know, got canned. You know, I mean, no. He did it with grace and dignity. had nothing but good to say about that congregation. He was blessing those who were cursing him. Man, I want to grow up to be like him, but I'll never have the opportunity. Just saying, okay. <laughs> he was a great, he's, he has an eternal way to glory. And listen, leaders, parents, and all the other leaders that are listening to this, watching this right now, you have an eternal way to glory. When you live for the Lord, honor him in all your ways, despite that people are not responding like you'd like them to. So we want to grow. Let's, let's evaluate our ROI on the deal, our return on investment. The time you put in, are you getting something back now and for eternity? Let's remember, first question, is your attitude that obey, submit thingy? Is your attitude raised to obey all biblical instructions and yield to God's authorized authority? You see, if your heart's not right, you come to a service with your own agenda, and you're saying, well, I'm going to want to hear something that gets my job done. God's not here for your agenda. God's here to let you know what his word is, that you might live by his agenda. And therefore, your heart has to come with the attitude saying, whatever God's word says, I want to live that out more fully in my life. Your attitude will determine your altitude. Are you a committed member of a community whose leaders care about your spiritual growth? Two things there. Are you in a community of people who care about you, and are you committed? Are you committed? Are you, are you playing the edges, peripheral to the whole deal? You're not going to get anything out of that. You have to be, God never blesses uncommitted people. It just doesn't work that way. You're fooling yourself. You got your own idea of blessing. You say, I'll take a little bit from this guy, listen to a little bit of that guy, pick up a little bit on the radio, a little bit from the, you know, uh, here, there, that blogosphere, that, pick, and put my own little thing together. Have my You're living in a world of, of, I would say it's fantasy, but it's really a nightmare. Uh, you're in charge. You're the God of it all. Have a community. Be committed to. Don't play the field. Give yourself uh, that a community might grow with you. Uh, are you easily instructed, corrected, and affirmed? Or are you easily offended? You know, there's some who don't want to be offended and God approach them in just the right way. Otherwise, you know, my goodness, uh, I'm, going to be, uh, I'm going to be upset about all that. Well, okay. Uh, but understand, speaking the truth in love is going to sometimes come across as we all got to grow up. And so this is how we get our eye. When we yielded to the Lord, therefore we're going to grow in him according to the very blessings he provides, the various leaderships he brings in our life. Your blessed response to the instruction gives the best return on your investment. Let's pray. Uh, as we go to the Lord in prayer for the visitors here, we take just a moment to ask the Lord to help us to apply the word of God to our life. Uh, it takes a little intentionality. Faith is intentional. If you just say, well, I'm not going to really pay attention, you'll probably fall asleep or you'll probably you know, daydream or look at some of these fashions or whatever uh, because faith is intentional. And so as you gain the discipline of understanding the word of God and being able to apply it to your life, you'll be blessed and be a blessing to others. So take a moment. Maybe there's something in your life uh, the Lord can bring uh, healing to your heart. If you are hurt by a, uh, someone in a leadership role, a parent or a husband or, or a wife, uh, and you don't trust that anymore, bring that to the Lord. That might be an area you can grow in. 
uh, and, and therefore develop and have more blessing in your life. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you. And if you have not yet even personally come to faith in Yeshua, oh, uh, there's going to be a team up here in the front, the worship and prayer team, be here to pray with you. If you haven't yet personally trusted Messiah, don't leave here without trusting in him. Father, we thank you for your love and goodness and pray your blessing on us as a community that we might grow still more uh, in the love of God that that might seem as we serve one another, care for one another, encourage one another, speak the truth in love, and uh, find ourselves rejoicing in your presence. Thank you for loving us and caring for us. Help us now to be instruments of grace and good news, not only to one another, but to the world around us. For we ask this in the name of uh, the Messiah of Israel, the Savior of the world. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen.